Hello, welcome to Souls and Hearts Be With the Word. Uh, and I am Dr. Jerry Crete. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist in Atlanta, Georgia, and I'm here with... I'm Dr. Peter Melinowski. I am a clinical psychologist in Indianapolis, Indiana. And Be With the Word is our weekly show where we reflect on the upcoming Sunday readings. And this coming Sunday, we are looking at the baptism of the Lord. And uh, we're excited to be talking about that with you uh, this week. Uh, all right. Well, what we normally do is we uh, read through the readings. So we're about to do that. We're going to go through the readings. And uh, if you've already you know, read them, you can skip through this part. But before we get to that, we just want to give you the quick overview of our, our themes for this discussion. Because Dr. Peter and I, uh, separately and individually, uh, reflect on these readings and uh, make our own notes and think about the psychological psychological implications. And then right before the show, we just share it with each other. And so briefly, <laughs> we, yeah, we kind of yeah. like debrief on it. But w what we bring is usually different, which I hope you guys uh, find interesting each week, uh, our different takes and perspectives. And mine this week, my key concept or theme was we have to receive in order to give. Uh, so that's what I've got. And we'll explore that more in a, in a moment. Uh, Dr. Peter, what have you got? And I have what we judge most harshly in other people is often what we hate about ourselves. Ah, so great. Yeah. So listen for those themes as we, as we unpack, uh, as we unpack, uh, our psychological take on the readings today. And, uh, yeah, this is this is exciting. It is it never fails, Jerry. We've been doing this for a little while now that we come up with something totally different. Yeah, so one of these so weeks. Related. Right. <laughs> well, they, we relate them. We try to relate them. Yeah. But one of these weeks it'll be interesting if we ever actually do have the exact same thing. <laughs> I, I'll be shocked. It'll be an yeah. epiphany of some kind, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So All right. Well, let's go to our readings uh, and uh, so we'll uh, take turns reading them for you. And again, feel free to skip this little portion if you already have read them or if you need to listen to them again, listen again. All right. Uh, the first reading is from Isaiah 42. Thus says the Lord, here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one with whom I am pleased, upon whom I have put my spirit. He shall bring forth justice to the nations, not crying out, not shouting, not making his voice heard in the street. A bruised reed he shall not break, and a smoldering wick he shall not quench, until he establishes justice on the earth. The coastlands will wait for his teaching. I, the Lord, have called you for the victory of justice. I have grasped you by the hand. I formed you and set you as a covenant of the people, a light for the nations to open the eyes of the blind, to bring out prisoners from confinement and from the dungeon, those who live in darkness. So the second reading is from the 10th chapter of Acts. Peter proceeded to speak to those gathered in the house of Cornelius, saying, In truth, I see that God shows no partiality. Rather, in every nation, whoever fears him and acts uprightly is acceptable to him. You know the word that he sent to the Israelites as he proclaimed peace through Jesus Christ, who is the Lord of all. What has happened all over Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. He went about doing good and healing all those oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And then the gospel according to Matthew chapter 3. Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and yet you are coming to me? Jesus said to him in reply, Allow it now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. After Jesus was baptized, he came up from the water, and behold, 
the heavens were opened for him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming upon him. And a voice came from the heavens saying, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. That's the Gospel of the Lord. All right, what fantastic readings uh, this week again. But yeah. uh, it's nice to see you, Peter. I hope you've uh, been doing well this Christmas yeah. season. I, it's been busy but good, and it's good to see you, Jerry. Good to see you as well. Yeah, I see you've got your Christmas mug today. I'm very, still being Christmassy. Very right? festive. It, it's very still, festive. Until Candlemas, right? Is that right? Right, until February 2nd, right? <laughs> Presentation of the Lord. Oh. So, all right. Did you want to start? I, I thought your theme sounded so fascinating. Yeah. So I, you know, two, there's a verse in here that's my favorite verse. I, one of my favorite verses in all of the Old Testament. And this is, a bruised reed he shall not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench. All right. So now these these this is referring to Jesus. This is a you know this is a prophecy about who who our Lord is uh, who our Lord is when he when he walks the earth, and it's um it's just it just reveals the gentleness of our Lord, um in working with our weakness with our imperfections with our um with our our, our our the harm or the damage we've sustained that we've inflicted on ourselves through our own sins and that others have inflicted on us and so that just to me has always been really striking as a psychologist um and i've really treasured those verses um in part because of you know kind of my own history my own experience of of um not really wanting to tolerate weakness not wanting to tolerate imperfections you know i've had I had a drive to, to, to really want to be perfect and to reject the parts of me that were imperfect, you know, mm-hmm. or that didn't seem to measure up. So, so that's always been really, um, that's always been, that's been really helpful to me and, and really nurturing to me. And it's also informed my career in uh, working with other people. So, well, could you that's say where something? I started? So that's where I started. No, I love yeah. that. And could you say something about it? Cause when we were talking before, I was saying, you know, I actually kind of glossed over this part because in my head, I don't think reeds and wicks. So right. I didn't even really c- c- tangibly picturing it. So when you say, oh, what was it a wounded or was it a, a, a bruised reed? A bruised reed. What yeah. is a bruised we- reed? So reeds, reeds grow up often from the water, right? And they've got a number of different uses. They can, they, they're often hollow. They were used to weave mats and things like that in the, in the Old Testament. So they were actually kind of important in a lot of ways. Uh, and so... Um, and one thing about reeds is that if you compromise the fiber structure on it, they'll, they'll, they'll bend over, they'll break. They won't be as useful, right? They won't be as useful. So uh, you don't want your reeds bruised if you're trying to use them for mat making or things like that, because they'll lose, they'll lose uh, mm. some of the properties that make them valuable. Um, so they were often considered like not help, not useful. They'd be thrown mm. out, burned or whatever. Uh, and so, you know, a bruised reed, something that would be considered of little value, Mm. is actually not going to be discarded by, by, by our Lord, right? Mm. I mean, this is part of a larger context, because just before that, um, you know, what this passage does is it helps to prepare the Israelites to recognize the coming of Jesus, right? So they say, you know, for example, that Jesus, when he comes, um, will not cry out, he'll not shout, he'll not make his voice heard in the street. You know, so... This is to counter the expectation that so many of the Israelites had that the Savior was going to be, the Messiah was going to be somebody cast in their own vision, a military leader, for example, right. somebody who was going to use force, right? Who was going to come in with power and might and, and subjugate people uh, uh, to his will, mm-hmm. right? And that's not at all what our Lord was like. You know, what our Lord is like. And so this image of him gently working with us, coaxing us, loving us in our imperfections, this is something that's taken me decades to actually begin to internalize. And yeah. so that's why that's so important to me. So it's, yeah, I mean, it's like, because, because you know, what, what, what people were expecting was something that was more cast in their own image and likeness, right? Rather than 
being actually who God is in his essence, mm. you know? Um, so thank you. That actually really helps me, you know, to conceive of it. It's so, it's a, I, I can't believe like what a profound little passage that I, I actually just kind of glossed over because it was right. using language that I don't think of, you know, or I don't, I doesn't, I don't relate to, but once it's explained, it's like, wow, I'm a wounded reed. We're all wounded reeds. And yet, and we have this temptation to just either look at other people as wounded reeds too and right. discard them or look right. at ourselves as wounded reeds and discard ourselves. On or some parts level. of ourselves, right? Like or mm. parts of ourselves, this aspect of myself, I hate, right? So like one of the things that I rejected in myself growing up was anything having to do with weakness. I absolutely did not want to be weak, you know? Uh, and so that meant that also that meant that I didn't tolerate vulnerability very well. I didn't tolerate, um, being childlike very well, right? There was a lot of things where I, I really wanted to be very independent, very counter-dependent, you know, uh, not need anybody, not need anything, you know, and that was, you know, that was me rejecting this, this, uh, these aspects of myself that were essential for me in order to be empathetic, to be able to connect with other people, to be able to love, to be able to relate with children, you know, and things like that. So, so this passage helped me to recover some of that. I mean, there was, you know, there were other things that helped me recover it as well, but that's one of the mm -hmm. reasons why I so cherish this because sometimes we think of the old Testament God as being like, you know, fire and brimstone and judgment and, you know, and all this, uh, you know, or, you know, and we have these distorted images of God uh, that really underappreciate his gentleness, his attunement, his love for us. So, yeah. 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 No, I mean, for me, it's interesting you say that. I think that I probably, in my own childhood or whatever, in my own experiences, rejected people who came off too strong. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, rather than tried to be that or whatever, like it was more like a rejection of it. And, but, but what can happen then is that then I over-identify with, um, you know, being, I don't know if it's over-identify with being weak, but over-identify perhaps with uh, this idea that maybe I'm not worth anything, that mm -hmm. I am a, a wounded reed, a, mm -hmm. a bruised reed. And that sort of becomes a little bit my identity, and so at least some part of me does. And so, you know, the powerful thing here is hearing, you know, basically, uh, you know, the message that he's come to, like, find the people who are wounded and broken and in prison or blind because if you were blind right in the, mm -hmm. especially in ancient times yeah you know, that's a huge yeah. thing you were yeah. you were the weakest of the week like you couldn't do much for your, as much for right. yourself right and so and yet jesus came mm -hmm. for those people so for me it's like wow i identified with the woundedness and the fact that he's actually seeking me out uh as a person who is wounded and that's, that's one of the things that if you notice here in, in the way that Jesus lived out the gospel, he always had crowds around him. He wasn't some sort of untouchable celebrity, you know, with a phalanx of guards around him or whatever. He was always, you know, in there amongst the people, people grabbing onto his cloak, right? Like the woman with the hemorrhage, right? You know, the, he was very immediate, very accessible, very 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 near to all of these broken reeds or these bruised reeds right and and these smoldering wicks that we are yeah. um and uh, not high and mighty like the like the roman emperors right or you know mm. or the so could you say more about because your your theme so interesting and it's like you you were talking about you know seeing the woundedness or broken, not broken, maybe bruisedness, bruisedness. someone else. Yeah. Cause it's almost like the temptation, oh, I'm just going to snap them. <laughs> right. <laughs> right? right. Like, like be gone, you know? Right. <laughs> uh, and and yeah. say more about that. So, so within, so, so within um, some of the ways that I was trained as a psychologist, even more recently, the, the, the um, we tend to be threatened when we pick up in other people, what we really don't accept about ourselves, right? So one of the things when, when I was in high school, when I was in college, um, men who came across as, as what I would call weak, right? Which also included things like just sensitive or, you know, I, I had a pretty visceral negative reaction to that. 
you know, I, in my guts, I just didn't like that. I treated that with um, some contempt and some disgust because um, it was, uh, it was threatening to me. I didn't want my own weakness uh, to be exposed. And in fact, one of the reasons I, I went into psychology, frankly, was because I wanted to have, I wanted to know the best of what the secular world had to say about how essentially I could save myself. You know, I really went into psychology with this agenda to figure out what is the, yes, I'm Catholic, you know, I uh, appreciate the church and so forth, but I want to know like what other opinions are out there. Um, and, um, and so, and part of that was so that I would not have to ever be weak. And right. And so in the last three years, I've been really working with St. Um, with St. Teresa of Lisieux, the little flower, who is all about, you know, being small, being childlike, being weak, relying on God with that kind of dependency. And before, if in college, you know, uh, St. Teresa of Lisieux made absolutely no sense to me. In fact, I, I, I didn't like her work at all. Didn't like it while I was in grad school. Didn't like it after I got out of grad school for many years until just relatively recently. Why? Because I didn't want to accept that I had to be dependent on God. I, did, I had the fantasy, and I wouldn't have said it this way, but there were parts of me that held on to the fantasy that if I could only become strong enough, competent enough, you know, um, uh, smart enough, work hard enough, that essentially I could um, achieve uh, the love of God. I could earn the love of God. Very Pelagian. That's a heresy of Pelagianism, right? Very Pelagian way of looking at God that parts right. of me were very heavily invested in. And that made it hard for me to like connect with uh, my kids in some ways when they were little, you know, because I didn't like the weakness in my sons. You know, I didn't like that at all. Um, I wanted them to be tough too. And that led me to be harsher with them, I think, you know, in terms of the way they interacted with them than, than I should have been, you know, and mm -hmm. that's, I'm sad about that. In fact, you can kind of feel that coming up now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, fortunately, we've had lots of opportunities to, to kind of work through that repair and so forth and have good relationships with my sons. But, um, but that's part of the cost of, um, you know, of, uh, of holding on to those beliefs for me, right. We're not accepting this. You know. So what happens now? Like, what, what are you doing now with that? Or how does this reading speak to you in terms of, you know, now that you, if you recognize that dynamic, that right. you, you, it's something you don't like in yourself that's causing you to kind of project that onto others. What do you well, do yeah. now? Well, now, I mean, some of this has come, come from some of Father Jacques Philippe's work, who I really, I really appreciate his work. You know, if I notice that I'm, I'm really getting... Uh, agitated or if I'm getting um, in some way off, off kilter in my interactions with somebody else, one of the questions I ask is, is this tapping into something I don't like about me, right? Because the stuff that tends to destabilize us the most is the stuff we don't like within ourselves, right? That's what really, the stuff that really gets under our skin hmm. is already under our skin. It's already there and it's just getting activated by seeing it in somebody else, right? So, um, so I use, uh, one of the things I think about a lot is like if I'm working with a, a client or if I'm working with a family member, if I'm interacting with a family member or something like that where something's happening and I'm getting frustrated, I'm getting, I'm getting angry at that person. Um, I'm thinking about, am I, is there something going on where I don't want to accept something within me? Um, and that was actually part of the, some of the, the training I've been doing in recent years as, as a psychologist. So it's like, wow, that's really interesting. That's actually come from a secular perspective. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I don't know if that gets into what you're asking though, Jerry. I'm, well, I, mean, I guess I'm curious, how do you become gentler with yourself then? Uh -huh. How do you tend to, like if you recognize, oh, there's a part of me that doesn't want to be weak. Right. What do you do with that then? Well, so I, I actually do believe that we have like these different parts within us, like these different sides of ourselves, right? And so, mm -hmm. I, you know, when I, when I came to appreciate that this part that doesn't want me to be weak, you know, this part that doesn't want me to be weak, recognize, I recognize that that part, I listened to that part and says, it, it wants me to survive, right? Because there were some environments that I was in where being weak or presenting it as weak attracted hazing or bullying or things like that. Like, mm. or I saw other people getting hazed and bullied and I, you know, I said, and I said, I'm never going to let that happen to me. Right. Okay. And, um, 
And, you know, a lot of times it's been reinforced. Like I never have trouble with dogs chasing me. I actually chase dogs when I'm running. You know, I don't, I've never, you know, I, I can, I can, you know, rise up. It's been adaptive in some ways, right? Being cross-examined by attorneys, you know, in, in forensic cases, legal cases, I never have trouble with that. I, I don't, I don't, you know, because I, I have these protections, but, but what it, but what I realized is that that's like a survival mechanism for me not to be weak was a way I learned how to cope with the world. And so I appreciate that about myself, but I also need to appreciate that there are times where I need to be weak in terms of being vulnerable, in terms of being sensitive. That's absolutely indispensable in doing good clinical work, especially with as much trauma work as I do. Right. right. So I'm starting to appreciate that, you know, these, 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 these drives, these drives within me, they, they have some good motives there, you know, uh, but they're just going about things in ways that are kind of problematic, you know? Um, so I'm, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm trying to understand like, you know, what is this about me and how is it trying to be helpful and how is it off? You know, right. um, you know, how is it, how is it no, no longer helpful? Um, I know. So, well, you know, I think what you just said there actually might be a good segue into my concept. Yes. My thing, yes. Because, um, and I wasn't sure where they would meet, but I think they just met right there. Okay. Because um, in mine, I'm talking, and what I was thinking about was talking about having to receive, you know, in order to give. We hear that right. you have to give in order to receive, but, but we actually have to receive. And I think Jesus, you know, is being portrayed here, um, both in Isaiah and, and, and obviously in Matthew, as the servant of God, right? Like he's the one who was chosen. He's the one with whom God is well pleased. But he comes, what's so cool is like he comes for baptism. You know, and then John says, you know, whoa, I can't baptize you. You know, you're the one, you should be baptizing me. Right. And, and of course, right? Because John recognizes, knows who Jesus is. Uh, but, but in reality, but Jesus' response is, no, all things must be fulfilled for righteousness. And so he's showing us the way. Right. And, and he's showing us um, kind of what are the way to become a servant of God, the way to be someone who serves. And so um, he obviously undergoes baptism. He hears those words. You are my beloved son. And to me, I just think it's so beautiful. For me, that, that passage is one of the most beautiful in the entire Bible. You are my beloved son. That's, God the Father speaking to God the Son, speaking to Jesus, and in and, and, and whom I'm well pleased. And what I love about it is Jesus has not actually done anything yet. He hasn't started yeah. his ministry. So he hasn't done the great work he's about to do. Um, I'm sure he's done some good things, but we just don't know about it. This, but, but he's well pleased in him for who he is. He is. Not yeah. for anything he's done yet. And, and that is so important that Jesus receives this affirmation uh, in terms of who he is. And, he's, and it's all part of, and why he has to do it when he doesn't need, Jesus already knows, I think. But, but he, he needs to show us that God is also, as a, as a child of God, as an adopted child of God, as a, you know, we, when we enter our baptism, when we enter baptism, that's our identity too that we are beloved because God created us, because God loves us and wants to redeem us and redeems us through baptism, that we, are, we become beloved children of God as well. And so, that's, that's, that's really critical because I didn't like this passage in high school and in college and in grad school. I found it really troubling. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't respond in any way like you did to it because I'm like, well, that's, that's God loving Jesus. He's the, you know, in whom I am well pleased. God is not pleased with me. Right. You know, I mean, I take it that way. Right. You know? Right. Uh, and so, yeah, I mean, it, that goes exactly to your point of how we need to know that we're loved, not right. because of what we do, like you were saying, right, right. But because of who we are, our identity as, as sons and daughters of God. Yeah. And, and you know, what I think is, is interesting here is, Going back to Isaiah then, because it's these are these words are echoed right in Isaiah, at the beginning right. of Isaiah, my servant whom I uphold, my right. chosen one with whom I am pleased. But then this line, upon whom I have put my spirit, and so not only are we created in God's image and we have this identity that's beloved by God, but He puts a spirit in us, so He empowers us. Right, and so we have to receive that. We have to receive that exactly right. Yeah. And then, 
before we go and do a million things, because of course the tendency everyone wants to do, we all want to do all these things in hopes that maybe God will be happy with me. Yes. Maybe I'll get affirmed by doing these things. Right. And that's the opposite of what's actually being said here in scripture. That, that in fact, all we have to do is come to God, submit, hear who we are, like receive it because that is just powerful that we're beloved. And then, allow him to put his spirit in us you know what i, I know i'm gonna sound I'll, I'll let my geeky side come out just a little bit it's like <laughs> like in the, you can pick any number of superheroes but for some reason shazam is coming to me right okay. and when he says the word shazam you know i remember watching the show when i was a little kid and there's, <laughs> there's a movie that came out recently well you know and he says shazam he's this little kid and he becomes the super powerful right you know captain marvel or whatever superhero right. and so uh, and he has like the wisdom of Solomon and he's got the strength of Hercules. He's got, he's buff, right? And, and, and then he can go and save people and do things. Right. Well, I mean, I know that's, you know, fantastical, but in, in a some level, that's true for us. Like by, by hearing who we are and allowing the spirit to be put in us, like receiving God's spirit, then we're like Shazam. We have superpowers and we can go and do things like Jesus showed us. Jesus said, like he went and healed people after he started healing people. And Peter, the same thing, like Peter in the, in the Acts of the Apostles, like he starts doing healings. He starts preaching. He starts getting other people. He gets Cornelius's whole family that we met. It's mentioned in this passage, but there's whole, he and his whole family end up getting baptized. So it's like, he is now able to affirm others and give. Right. So we have right. to receive before giving. Yep. Absolutely right. Yep. And, and we have to start with our relationship with God, right? We can't just hope that we end up in relationship with God, which is sort of my, mm -hmm. my default position, right? It was to earn that, you know, earn the, 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 uh, the love of God. So that's really great and helpful to me, Jerry, that you're pulling out like, this is all happening at the very beginning of Jesus' public ministry. This is an epiphany, right, in the gospel right, right now. This is a manifestation of who, who Jesus is, right? Exactly. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, that's really beautiful that, you know, uh, you know, God essentially saying, I loved you first, right, mm -hmm. before any of this other stuff. And then what we do comes out of a response to that love, a response to having received that love exactly. rather than, trying to operate independently, autonomously of it, right? Which is what I was trying to do for, you know, 35 years. So, um, yeah. Yeah, wow. man, it was profound. I mean, that's the gospel really, right? And, and, and it, it so resolves the faith works dilemma between Catholics and Protestants, right? right? Because right. the reality is we, we, our works do flow from right. this faith, this experience. And then we hear it in the same thing, Peter, um, what is it? I'm trying to remember now, but um, yeah, it is an ax. And Peter says, uh, he's preaching, right? And he's saying that with God, you are acceptable to God. And right. he's talking to Cornelius, who's a Gentile. Right. So he's saying to the Gentiles, because the Jews already felt they were the chosen people, They were right? the chosen people. They were told that. They were so, the chosen people. And now here's, yeah. Right. And now here's Peter saying, um, God shows no partiality. You are acceptable. And what are the conditions of acceptability? At least Peter mentions in this passage are fear him, right. which is an aspect of, it's hard, we, we could talk someday about fear, right. but in, in how it's meant there, but it's really, right. faith. it's about having faith, it's submission right. Right. Right, to God and, and then act uprightly. So it's like faith and then works. Right. They go hand in hand and one right. flows from the other. And it, you know, and it's, but not, you can't just do works. Right. Without fearing God, without knowing God, without submitting to God, without receiving from God. Right. So. Beautiful. Ah, cool stuff. Wow. Cool, cool stuff. stuff. Well, you, we are, we are kind of coming up towards the end of the time for. The so we, we have to wrap things up. So we do want to let everybody know if you're, if you're listening, we have so many cool things coming up again this yes. week. I want to mention yes. some of them. Yeah. So we have, um, you know, one of the things is a blog post that's coming up on Thursday. We're going to be publishing that on, um, the ninth, um, and that's by Dr. Eric Udan, psychologist in Indiana, and he's going to be talking about changing yourself to help your children, which kind of ties into what I was talking about in my relationship with my kids today. And then we, um, we also have uh, another module being posted on how to help a loved one in distress, 
Catholic's Guide, and that's going to be on exploring options with people and how to do that. So if you haven't been catching up on all your uh, on that, that that particular course, it's free for, uh, from us with Souls and Heart. Hearts, and then we last week we published a, a fly on the wall, uh, which is uh, where six psychologists or six mental health professionals, all Catholics, get together and talk about what does it mean to have boundaries? What does it mean to have boundaries between a client and a therapist, and how do you navigate those? So, interesting, fascinating stuff. We got stuff coming out three or four times a week. There's a lot going on at the, uh, uh, at Souls and Hearts. Um, yeah. You can check that out on. Um, you can check those things out on our website, soulsandarts.com, or you can go to your favorite uh, podcast feed. Um, it's also going to be up on YouTube and, um, yeah. So Spotify and iTunes. Spotify, I, uh, yeah, Apple Podcasts. Uh, yes. So, yeah. So, so, um, so let's get to uh, our action items for this week. Yes, our um, action items. Mine, because, of course, my theme was we have to receive in order to give. So, I mean, on one hand... Uh, following the readings, we have to hear God's word. You know, we have to hear who we are. And I love the imagery of holding his hand. So maybe that's a way of looking at it is holding God's hand. We just let him hold our hand. Uh, be open to being formed because he also talks about forming us and see how he's formed us and, and then do some action. So the, our superpower is the same sense is, is what God has given us, right? Our superpower is, is, is the ability to help someone else see who they are as a child of God, that they are beloved in who they are. So um, my actual, you know, in a nutshell, the action item I'm going to give is to affirm someone today, you know, affirm someone today. In other words, don't focus on what they've done or what they've done bad or good for that matter, but really, you know, focus on it, saying some truth to someone you care about, about who they are, you know, and, and expressing in some way that they're beloved to you, that they are precious to you. And they're precious to you not because they did something, but because you see them and you see something beautiful in them. So that's your, and, and you know what? And just be curious to see what you do. If you do that, uh, how, first of all, how it feels, because I, personally find it feels really good to do that for someone, but also noticing how they respond, Yeah, you know, and yeah. just allowing the response to be whatever it is, but just notice it. Yeah. There's a, a psychiatrist by the name of Conrad Bars, um, a Catholic psychiatrist, psychiatrist that has a whole therapy based on affirmation. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, so my, my action item is to, uh, is a little, is a little different. It says, I'm, I'm going to say, look at who you judge because we all judge people, right? If you don't know that you're doing that, or if you don't think you are, let's look a little deeper, right? We all judge people. Um, look at who you judge and what you judge them for, right? Uh, those bruised reeds you're tempted to break, right? And then write down what you don't like. Like for me, it was weakness, right? But write down what you don't like in other people who stir you up. Right? And then see if you can be gentle with yourself about that, right? Again, for me, weakness, right? Vulnerability. See if you can embrace that within yourself and see some good in it or some good that is trying to be brought about, right? Um, mm -hmm. By that. Um, and just take that to your examination of conscience and take that to prayer. Ask for, for light from, from God. To let, ask him to show you, our Blessed Virgin Mother, to show you. Um, how that's working within you right so sounds good all right sounds good ah well i hope you, everyone listening i hope you all have a really good week uh and we're still in the christmas season still in the christmas season but we're in a new we're in 20 fully in 2020 uh hope you're having a great new year and uh Get in touch with us. Let's get some comments. You know, if you, what you liked about this, what you didn't like, what you understood, what you didn't understand, how you related it to your own life. Um, you know, get on our website uh, on this episode and let us hear from you. We'd love to, we'd love to engage with you. Um, so. And so we'll see you next time. In the meantime, be still. Believe. Be loved. Be loved. Take good care. God bless.